This is Talking Drupal, a weekly chat about web design and development from a group of people with one thing in common. We love Drupal. This is episode 336, Discover Drupal. Welcome to Talking Drupal. Today we're talking about Discover Drupal with Angie Sabin. Angie works as the Chief Finance and Operations Officer at the Drupal Association. And she graduated from Linfield College and is currently based in Portland. She used to work at a Bicycle Transportation Alliance and the Street Trust. Angie, welcome to the show and thank you for joining us. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm Nick Laughlin and today my co-hosts are, as usual, John Picozzi. How are you doing? Hi, internet friends. Also joining us for the first week as guest host is Martin Anderson Klutz. Martin joined Aqua last year, but before that he was with Digital Echidna for six and a half years. He's been using Drupal for over 16 years and helps maintain a growing list of contrib modules and has spoken at various camps and conferences. Martin currently lives in London, Ontario, Canada, with his wife, son, cat, and dog. Martin, welcome to the show and thank you for joining us for the next four weeks. Thanks, excited to be here. Uh, we got a short update, uh, some news this week. I, um, I don't know about you guys, but I've been in the Drupal infrastructure channel on the Drupal Slack for a while because there's always some interesting stuff going on. Uh, and I noticed that last week, uh, Drupal 10.0.0-alpha2 was tagged. Hmm. Martin, do you have any, any comments on that? Yeah, absolutely. There's a number of exciting changes in there updated updates to the platform requirements. So moving to newer versions of PHP, now requiring 8.1. Also moving out of core, a couple of modules. So entity reference and migrate Drupal multilingual and a variety of other changes, including additional deprecated APIs have been pulled out. So, you know, exciting to see continued movement towards that 10.0 release. Yeah, one of the things that I really like about kind of hanging out in that channel, seeing how much testing goes into stuff. Like, I, I feel like about half the comments in that channel are about somebody trying to run some test and something failing and asking, you know, what's going on. It's just, you know, it's kind of comforting to see how how deep the testing goes. Um, although there was definitely some interesting test plot uh, issues around the, the Drupal 8 requirement. I think that that definitely made this a little unique, but, you know, one of the great things about, you know, the Drupal Association uh, and the infrastructure team managing this is that you know this stuff gets ironed out long before, long before we start using it. So we also have a new module of the week this week that was provided by Martin as well. Uh, so we have uh, the module search overrides. Can you tell us a little bit about why you would use that module? Absolutely. So really the module came out of a number of different client requests that I've heard over the years of clients who really want to be able to have some manual control over the top search results when someone goes to their website and, and runs a search. And there have been sort of a variety of, I would say, semi-hackish ways to do that in terms of maybe having a text field where you can sort of slam keywords in and then you know boost the relevance of that. But there actually is a capability native to or to Apache Solar that allows for basically passing in specific results to say these should be at the top of the results, and conversely to be able to pass in certain items that should be excluded for uh, that specific query. And so, hmm. I was digging through some Solar documentation about three years ago and came across this capability and realized it wouldn't be that hard to sort of wrap that into a Drupal module. And so, what this allows you to do is basically specify for a specific query, you know, are there certain items that should be at the very top and in which order? And then are there certain items that should be excluded from, from searches for those queries? And from a configuration standpoint, there's, there's definitely a place within the Drupal admin UI where you can go in and, and create all of these, but also in the more recent versions, you can go in as you're editing, let's say a node to say, I also want this to appear at the top for specific queries or to be excluded for specific queries and, and even launch kind of a modal where you can manipulate the order of those if, if oh, you know okay. that there are multiple ones that are uh, promoted for that query. So um, it is kind of an edge case. And I would say, you know, even as the maintainer, I know that there's the potential for misuse. I would say if, if a customer wants to use this a lot on their site, 
overuse it probably, then that probably means that they should really actually be tuning their relevance, you know, the, the overall solar configuration. But, uh, but definitely for specific use cases where, you know, let's say they're launching a new product and they just want it to make sure that one appears at the top for specific searches, as an example, um, it can be a pretty useful piece of functionality. I mean, it feels like the perfect use case for those vanity searches. You know, the the only search that the CEO checks and goes, hey, why isn't this at the top? It's like, well, we could overhaul the whole search thing or just promote that particular item for that search. Um, th I'm curious though, does it only work with um, when search API is using solar as a backend or does it also work with other backends? It does use a property that's specific to solar. So, so yes, it only works with search API solar. Okay. Good to know. Super useful. And Nick nailed the use case for it. The CEO searching for something like, why doesn't that appear at the top of the list? Well, we, there's a module for that. So moving into, uh, before we get into our primary topic, we actually have a message from Mike Anello about the Aaron Winborn uh, award nominations. Mike, take it away. Hey now, this is Mike Anello from the Drupal Community Working Group. I've been a longtime member of the Drupal community, username Ultimike. You may have heard me on this very podcast in the past, but I'm here to tell you about the 2022 Aaron Winborn Award nominations, which are now open. So we are looking for nominations from the Drupal community for folks who, quote, demonstrate personal integrity, kindness, and above and beyond commitment to the Drupal community. Each year at DrupalCon North America, we are lucky enough to award this to an individual who demonstrates those qualities, and we are looking for the next winner of the Aaron Winborn Award. So nominations are open until Friday, March 25th of this year, 2022, and the winner, of course, will be announced at DrupalCon North America. So if you know someone who is worthy of this award or just worthy of being nominated, please let us know. I have a nice short link for you. You can go to uh, bit.ly, so that's a bit.ly link, bit.ly slash AWA2022. AWA for Aaron Winborn Award and the year 2022. Once again, bit.ly, bit.ly slash AWA2022. Look forward to seeing your nominations. And thank you very much, Talking Drupal folks. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate uh, the info. And yes, be sure to, uh, be sure to nominate um, folks for the Aaron Wimborn Award. It's super important. So moving into our primary topic, uh, Angie, can you kind of just give us, what's the elevator pitch for Discover Drupal? Yeah, so the elevator pitch for Discover Drupal is just really about, um, you know, bringing people that are underrepresented in open source um, into the Drupal community by providing training opportunities, mentorship, um, and then career um, support in terms of things like resume um, building. Um, and, you know, we're uniquely positioned to help both access, um, provide access to the community with students and um, facilitate those relationships, um, but also um, work outside of the community, um, build relationships in places where um, we can access um, a diverse group of, of people, students, for instance, we've um, done some talks at HBCUs um, to, to get students interested in coming in. So we're kind of acting as this entity um, to support um, the program, um, pulling together existing training uh, resources that are already great and well-tested, um, leaning into our experience working with mentors and, and matching them to students. And um, we just wrapped up uh, the training for our first uh, pilot year program, which, which is exciting. And we're 
looking to build from here, keep it going and hopefully grow it. Um, we kept it a little bit small in scope for the first year, um, simply because we wanted to uh, sort of do a test run and see uh, how it went. <laughs> and it's going well, but we're definitely learning some lessons along the way. So. Sorry, you used an acronym there. I think it was HBCU. Yeah, historically black colleges and universities. Mm. Um, so, you know, just one obviously segment of um, underrepresented uh, communities. But one thing that, that we do find is that um, going into like college level, um, connecting with college level students or folks that maybe already have some technical training um, so that they're coming into the program and you know know that they're already interested um, and have a technical aptitude, I think is helpful. So um, we actually connected uh, with the first talk that we did, Tim and I went and talked to a group of students through a program called Open Doors, Open Source. And we actually were invited um, by someone I had been chatting with over at Google um, through the diversity um, and inclusion program there. And they connected us with a session and we had a whole bunch of interest from students just from that session um, wanting to, to come in and learn more about Drupal. You know, they, these folks just don't, have never even heard of Drupal in some cases. So even just going out and spreading the word and letting them know that there's this cool thing that exists um, where there's really great career opportunities is I think really yep. awesome. I'm shocked yeah, by the fact that there are people that have not heard of Drupal. <laughs> <laughs> totally yeah, shocked. I mean, yeah, but you, I mean, you kind of solve that by, you know, seeding that from the beginning of somebody's career too. Um, but before we move on, one of the questions that popped in, so it sounds like this is the first year of the program, but I'm curious about how long this program has been in the works. What, what kind of started it, the process? Yeah, so um, it's sort of a combination of a lot of things coming together. So it's definitely been something that um, was a passion project in the community. And I wanted to actually mention um, Gwendolyn Anello um, of Drupal Easy. Um, she reached out to me um, and said that she'd been chatting with a bunch of different folks in the community that were really interested in coming up with some sort of training program and that they felt like the Drupal Association would be kind of a good home for just facilitating that. So she really got the ball rolling. Um, and then also both myself and Heather, our executive director have a background um, and interest in just, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and uh, wanna see, um, wanna help facilitate, you know, more of, of that in the community. So we felt like it was a really good uh, fit for things that we're wanting to do and um, build upon and just seemed like a really good program. So we started chatting with Gwendolyn, Gosh, um, way back, I want to say in 2019, she first approached us to talk about it. And it was sort of a passion project at that point for me because, you know, I'm the chief finance and operations officer. So I'm not usually quite as directly involved in programming, but I was like, this is really cool. I'm going to carve out some time to, to try to make this happen and then, you know, get some volunteers involved. So we have a volunteer program manager and just different folks in the community have really stepped up um, to help move it along. But uh, yeah, so it's been in the works for, for quite a while. Launched our first um, cohort of students uh, late last year um, in their training. And they just wrapped up training um, in January and now they're working okay. on final project. Cool. So I think you sort of touched on it there, but tell us more about why Discover Drupal is important. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important for a lot of reasons. You know, I think um, all of us have heard, you know, great um, bits of information, whether it be in the Dries note and in Seattle, where Dries talked about um, the importance of equity um, and open source and how we can do better. Um, we also know that um, having more equity uh, in anything, whether it be Drup the Drupal community, um, the Drupal project, um, businesses, it builds resilience. Um, we also want to have uh, a, a pipeline, for lack of a better word, of new people coming into Drupal um, so that 
the project continues to be strong and resilient. So I think it hits a lot of important um, things and whether you know someone actually comes through the training or not, just building that awareness um, you know, they could maybe go through a different training or um, pathway. You know, we also have uh, shared with students um, other opportunities to learn. So even if they're not coming directly through this program, we're, we're just making people aware of what the opportunities are, because I think you probably all know that there's a huge demand for Drupal talent. Um, and we know that too, just the Drupal jobs board, um, we, we see lots of activity and Surprisingly, you know, even with the pandemic, it's been very resilient as much of technology has. So, uh, you know, I think there's a bit of a gap between the needs of Drupal talent and getting new people coming in as Drupal developers. So it's kind of trying to also solve for the problem of how do we get folks from entry level Drupal developers to what employers are looking for and start addressing that journey and hope, hopefully also working with some of the employers on um, how they address those needs themselves um, a bit more. So a lot of things really, <laughs> I think it mm -hmm. has a potential to, to really make some, some great changes. That's awesome. So diving into the program specifically, it, it looks like there are three main kind of role types um, that, that somebody could have. Um, can you uh, talk about uh, each one of those at kind of a high level, uh, the trainee, the mentor, and then the supporter? Sure. So um, starting with the trainee, so we that would be um, someone interested in launching a career in Drupal. Um, so um, the process there is that the, they, they apply for the program, um, expressing their interest, um, and we do meet with them um, to kind of get a sense of um, you know, how well they would be able to commit to the program to make sure that they're well positioned to succeed because it um, does require time. Um, and then, you know, we match them to a trainer. Um, for this first pilot project, we had three different kind of career pathways you could select from. Um, and they go through the journey of the training, they're matched to a mentor, and then they work on their final project. Um, all along the way, you know, regularly interfacing with our um, program manager and myself just to make sure that they're feeling well supported and understand um, what they need to succeed. Um, so that's the, the student um, or the trainee uh, mentors. So we had a really big network of mentors that um, applied this year. So the mentor journey looks like um, applying to express your interest. We have some, um, some sessions where we onboard them to what, what it looks like for the students so they know what they need to provide um, in terms of support to students. Um, we have sort of a, a multi-layer approach. We do both just a mentor student only Slack channel where they can um, interface and communicate with each other directly. Um, so it feels uh, it's private only in that we do find that students coming in are a little bit shy to the Slack world. So they're a little bit reluctant to, to jump in and chime in. So having that um, channel with just the mentors kind of provides a safe space for that. So mentors participate in Slack. And then we also have mentors that are directly assigned to students. So they meet with them weekly, um, in addition to just helping them with any questions they might have on their training materials, they also um, are tasked with sharing with them about their own experience, um, their own career, how they got to where they are, how they can get involved. Um, you know, there's obviously more than just your job in Drupal's. You, you are all Drupalers, so you know firsthand um, how active the community is. So we want to encourage these folks to come out of the program wanting to contribute um, to Drupal and be uh, really engaged. So mentors have that role. And then supporting is really just, you know, helping, helping financially to, um, to keep the program going. I mean, the, the cost for the training is fully paid for through the program. So um, we're providing full scholarships to the students. We're providing them with, um, 
a refurbished laptop. Um, oh, wow. And they're coming to DrupalCon um, on full scholarship. So as a supporter, you can um, support by donating a laptop, which is great, but um, even more importantly, just making a donation to the program um, is helpful. We have um, organizations that have actually sponsored the program and as part of their sponsorship, they get kind of uh, first dibs on <laughs> Uh, talking to the students and potentially inviting them to um, internships or other employment opportunities. Okay. Um, so those are those are the different roles. So you, you mentioned when you were talking about the trainees that there's kind of three different career paths that they can choose from. Can you, I, I'm curious about, first of all, what those are, but also curious about if you saw like an even distribution or if people were kind of favoring one or the other. Yeah, absolutely. So the three pathways that we um, that we had for the year were front end developer, back end developer, and, and then site builder. There was definitely okay. a large preference toward front end. We had the largest oh, really? group of students. Yeah, I think people are you know the visual components and you know it seems a little more flashy. I think um, we had more students in that pathway than the other two. Um, I think that uh, we might change things up a bit. We're, we're still kind of making some determinations about how we might evolve the program, but I think that we might end up going with a little more broad um, education where they're getting a little bit of everything so they can kind of determine later on where they might wanna go because I think the other thing we, we found is it's too early to really know. <laughs> yeah where you wanna go. So I think a broader education um, and then potentially if we can have uh, a more specific focus once they've gone through that um, hmm. uh, might might be how we do it. I mean, the interesting thing and, and this is all, so I'm not a Drupal developer. So it was very interesting to try to design this program with literally yeah. no background in Drupal. I also, you know, some of the Drupal, um, insider language and things like that that are very specific to Drupal. I, you know, so it, it was kind of helpful because I was able to see where there might be challenges for someone new coming in because I had those challenges myself. Um, but also I learned that there, there are definitely lots of different approaches to learning Drupal. Even amongst our trainers, everybody had sort of a different way of looking at and doing things. So while that's really cool and a really cool part of open source and Drupal. It also creates some unique challenges when you're trying to create a program like this, because you have, you want to try to make sure there's some consistency for the students in their experience, um, you know, and, and then how do we make sure we're monitoring their learning and success. So we're still working on some of that, um, but it definitely helps that we've you know, for instance, Drupal Easy is one of the training um, programs. And I should also mention our trainers um, provided significant um, discounts. So they they also underwrote some of the um, training costs. So they weren't just, okay. you know, making money on the program. They, they were sponsors themselves of the program. Okay. So can you dive in a little bit more into the mentor's responsibilities? So you kind of mentioned... I think you mentioned that there's a couple of different types of mentors. Um, I'm hearing that there's people that are trainers, there's individual mentors, and then there's kind of a, a group of general mentors. Because from what I gather, there's actually more mentors than trainees right now. Um, there are, yeah, there are more. And, and part of the reason that we um, have more mentors than students is one, we wanna make sure that we've got good coverage. So we have um, office hours, for instance, where students are able to pop into Slack and ask questions or sometimes pop onto Zoom or you know whatever video tool that they wanna use. Um, so the different roles for mentors are really either just being a general part of the mentor network where you come and participate in office, office hours and then the other role is, is being a direct mentor. So you can still participate in the office hours, but you are, are actually assigned a student that you would meet with one-on-one, -on -one, build that personal relationship with. 
Um, mm -hmm. We were sort of hoping that in creating the mentor network, students would be able to self-select a mentor, like get to know them. But what we found was, was that, um, and I don't know if this is just the pandemic um, and people having a little bit of online fatigue, but we found that the students um, just weren't as involved in Slack and were a little more shy than, which is totally fine. So we, next time around, I think we will match people like right out of the gate because I don't think the students okay. were really prepared to just like self-select a mentor and get to know someone virtually and all the things that we hoped had happened. Um, I think we'll be matching folks early on um, in the process. Yeah, and I, and I wonder if maybe there's a way to do that so that they can have a choice, like maybe they meet with a couple of mentors for some short intros. Yeah, yeah one thing we, than... absolutely, and we also did some some um, more in-depth questions with the mentors to get to, to know what their interests are and, you know, where they're at. Um, so there's some time zone overlap and things like that um, so that we can either match them at least regionally. So in some cases, if, if folks are kind of living in the same area, it'd be great if they could get together and meet in person. That didn't happen because it was all during the pandemic. So nobody was really able to meet in person, but um, that was the kind of the hope. And then also if there are some other common interests um, outside of Drupal, it kind of just makes it nice um, to, to have that extra bit of connection. What's the criteria to become a mentor? Uh, the criteria to become a mentor is really mostly about making the commitment and having the time. And then if you have previous mentoring experience, um, you know, we, we do prefer, um, there's some preference given there, but we also want to build new mentors and have more mentors in the Drupal community. So it wouldn't necessarily exclude you from being a mentor, but um, the criteria is just really the commitment and availability to be able to commit to, um, you know, coming to the meetings, participating in the Slack, um, and you should have experience in, you should be a Drupal developer so that you can answer the, the questions for the students. <clears throat> Assuming or or site builder or front end developer, right. like we're not yeah. necessarily just a back end developer, right? Yeah, thank you. Um, what's the I guess what's the time commitment there, right? So we you know obviously mm -hmm. the criteria is, is heavily based on time. Uh, what's the time commitment both for a mentor and and maybe a trainee? Sure. So the program, the first pilot program was a year long. We're actually wrapping up. Um, uh, at DrupalCon Portland, we'll have, I believe, at least a big majority of students will be coming. Um, we're being a little more flexible on that just in terms of if they're comfortable traveling right now. Um, but we'll have some students there as far as I know. They're all planning, most of them are planning to come. Um, so, but it was a year long commitment from the students. Um, and the, the bigger time commi commitment is really with the students because they're going through training and depending on the pathway they were in, it was anywhere from, you know, five to 10 hours a week of training and then their Slack hours and then an hour meeting with a mentor. Um, and then during the final project phase that we're in now, the commitment scales back a little bit, but it's um, at minimum three hours a week, um, but it could be even more. So the students are actually in the project browser initiative right now. Um, okay. Just getting assigned tasks weekly from, from that team and get they're participating in the um, asynchronous meetings for that and working Lucky in the- Lucky Chris Wells, all that help, <laughs> wow. Yeah, I don't, so it's been a little interesting. Um, we, we initially had hoped to have, you know, the students like create something but since we had more folks in that front end pathway and just, um, you know, limited capacity internally in terms of being able to support um, that kind of a project, we were like, well, maybe, maybe actually the more important thing is for them to participate in something that's 
really going to be impactful and actually is a, a thing and not just, uh, not just yeah. build a site. So um, that was a really great little bit of, of um, insight from volunteers. And um, we've had Amy June, who you all probably know, really step up as a mentor. And she's been a total lifesaver because she's been jumping in and helping where I have technical knowledge gaps about what the students need to do and what they need to learn. So, you know, I think for our own improvement, um, we want to be able to properly resource <laughs> the role from the DA side internally. Um, so that's part of the fundraising effort. We're going to be continuing to, to try to make sure that we can give it enough capacity for it to, to really succeed. Um, but it's, it's, uh, from the mentoring side, sorry, I didn't really answer your question there. It, it depends on which sort of mentor role you fall into. If you're part of just the broader mentor network, you know, it's, about a year long commitment and it's a couple of hours a week. Um, but it's not, you know, like if you need to miss a week, there's enough mentors that we always have coverage, which is why we have more mentors than students to ensure that that's always a thing. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're a direct mentor, I would say that it's, you know, a few more hours. Um, and then okay. long, long term, we also have a volunteer role that Allison Manley from Canopy has been pl playing where she's, helping me with the role that ideally uh, we'd hire someone on staff to do, which is just to project manage the whole thing and make sure everything keeps moving. Yeah. And uh, Amy June would, would yell at us if we didn't ma mention that she was an Aaron Winborn award winner. Um, she likes to drop that in there. So <laughs> she, yes, yeah, she was last there, year. I think there we go that we've, we've filled that obligation. Um, so Looking at, uh, like, I'm, I'm sold, I'm like, wanna, you know, I, I can meet the requirements, I can meet the time commitment. Um, looking at the mentor application window, it looks like it's closed for this round. Um, wondering when uh, it would be opening again for, for the next round. Yeah. So assuming timing goes well and is, is consistent with, um, what we did this year, we would launch as cohort of students in the fall. So that means we would be opening up applications later the spring. So, you know, just uh, candidly after DrupalCon is probably the answer. We're trying to put, you know, the first in-person DrupalCon in after two years, which is um, a, a lot of work for the team. So I think just to make sure that we're um, giving it the proper uh, support internally. We'll probably try to do a similar timeline, but I think uh, by early spring, we'll be announcing externally kind of what the plan is. Um, so people can absolutely reach out to me and let me know that they're interested and they wanna, you know, wanna hear more as soon as we know more. That's totally uh, great. I'd love to hear from people. Um, okay. And you know, keep keep an eye on the Discover Drupal uh, webpage on Drupal.org, um, where we'll keep uh, information updated there as well. But we we do try to also just talk about it in the newsletter, the Drupal Association newsletter, so that people know. Um, I think I did some blog posts, so we try to communicate pretty broadly so that people catch it <laughs> one way or the other. So the program right now is limited to North America, right? Um, is the plan to move the program to a more global audience at some point? That is our hope. Absolutely. I think, um, you know, the biggest challenge I think that I can see out of the gate with that is just um, the capacity challenge of making sure that uh, we've got someone that can, can be available and, and work with people in different time zones, which is something we have plenty of experience in doing, um, but uh, we just want to make sure that we're doing it well. Um, so, you know, absolutely, we want to do that. I've already had trainers reach out to me to express interest, and I have okay. kind of an ongoing list. So, you know, I think it's important. Um, we're obviously a, a global community, um, and 
we don't want to just focus on North America. We want to make sure that everybody um, can be involved. So. so you mentioned earlier that supporters can donate computer hardware or they can donate money. Are there other ways that supporters can help the program? It sounds like maybe training support could be helpful also. Yeah, I think um, training support can be helpful. Um, you know, or if there's even, so we had sort of our primary um, trainings, uh, Drupal Eyes Me also provided the students a one-year subscription so that they were able to supplement. So if you have, you know, training materials or, you know, webinars or things like that, that are proprietary that you want, that you would be able to share with us, that would be cool. Um, or, you know, I'm open to <laughs> suggestions. I think, um, like I said, since there's not really just one, it's not like there's a Drupal curriculum that, you know, everybody goes through and then they graduate with a certificate. So I think there's just, there's so much you could learn and so many different ways you can learn it that um, if, if folks have trainings or things like that, that they think would be really important, we're, we'd, we'd love that support. Can individuals support the program? Um, in terms of absolutely, like financially, there mm -hmm. you can support the program. Um, we had um, an anonymous donor give some money to the program um, this year, which was super cool. I think there's a donation button on the website. There, there is. Um, that's that's where the question came. Yeah, from. there's a donation button on the website. Yeah, you can absolutely thank you for that uh, <laughs> for that little cue. Yeah, absolutely. So you can go to the Discover Drupal site, and I believe it's um, Drupal.org/slash/discoverdrupal. Um, of course, we can check that later, but um, there is a, a way there to make a donation that would be specific to Discover Drupal. So if you donate there. We know that's where you want the money to go, um, you know, and, and rather than just a general donation. Although I will say, as you highlighted at the start of the program, we do employ that awesome group of uh, Drupal engineers that keeps Drupal running. So any donation you make to the Drupal Association is really doing great things for Drupal, whether it's Discover Drupal or just a more uh, broad uh, donation, it all helps. Uh, as, as we get closer to the end, one of the things I, I've been thinking about throughout the show is how many students are there or how many trainees are there? So we had a larger group of students go through the training than who actually are now in the final project stage. So one of the key things that we highlighted as a challenge and that we're trying to now figure out is um, students coming out of college looking for employment are sort of, there's a little bit of a conflict there with learning Drupal because you have to have the free time. Um, and in some, some places choose between active employment <laughs> or, you know, we had students get job offers where suddenly they were no longer available. So we started out with, okay. with more students and they loved it. We got great feedback. They wanted to do it, but you know, they were like, I got a job and my boss won't let me, um, Put the time in during the day so whether it's figuring out how we can lean into some of those time zone differences so that there are tra there are trainings available at night um we had students from all over the country um whether it's maybe the sponsorships include part of your sponsorship is that you're hiring the person as an intern, which is an idea I really yeah. like. I don't know how we can, if that's something we'll be able to talk sponsors into doing, but I think if they were working for um, a Drupal agency or you know whoever and, and had an internship where they're, they have some on the job training, they're employed and they're also going through the training, to me, that sounds really ideal, but I think um, we just got to see what the interest does for that. I know that, um, a lot of folks that are hiring want, they want the super senior Drupal developers. Yep. Not a, So I think we have to figure out as a community, how do we address, there's a, a, there's a dire need in my opinion to address, well, how do, if we aren't hiring any entry level there's folks, yeah. how do you there's ever get more? See, yeah, there's always gonna be um, 
a talent shortage unless we start addressing the fact that we need people and in interns. And I think, you know, if I were hiring or wanting to hire, it's kind of ideal to have someone come go through a training that's on scholarship and then also learn like what you're, you know, specifically um, doing uh, maybe your version of Drupal or you need someone in site building specifically or whatever it is. I think that would be really beneficial uh, for employers. So I, I, that's kind of where I'm personally seeing this evolve to, but <clears throat> obviously it takes a little bit of doing to ask people to commit to that. So, so, we'll so how, how many are there right now though? I don't think I for students, there are, yeah. uh, we had five that went through the program. We started okay. with, with eight, um, okay. all eight, um, except for one finished the actual training, but the, there are, um, there are four now that have been able to do continue on to the final project okay. stage. And, and one more question that I had about that, because you've mentioned college a couple of times, do you have to be in a college program to be eligible for this or is anybody interested in a Drupal career that fits and the you other do criteria not have available? to the only criteria that we had was that you were over 18 and part of that was that one of our trainers is uh, accredited as a profession uh, in the state of Florida Drupal easy that was a requirement that they had inter for their program so that was more a function of making it um, consistent across the board. Um, so you don't have to have a college education at all. Um, so I think there's, you know, as we grow there, we can think of other ways to, to reach out to folks that aren't educated through college or traditional uh, means. And we did actually um, recruit uh, in other places, not just the HBCUs, um, I have some other experience um, from another job that you didn't mention at the start, uh, an organization called Eco Districts that was um, working mm -hmm. in communities and um, that have uh, marginalized folks um, and a lot of times looking for employment opportunities. So I had some contacts from my days at that role um, where we, we were able to just share with some different um, job networks. So we did get some candidates that, that were not um, coming through college. Okay. So th that opens up our question based on, based on what you just said. And then what you previously said, right. There's like a little bit of a gap there where like people are maybe coming out of college or maybe like getting into the workforce and they don't mm -hmm. necessarily know about Drupal, but yet employers are looking for that Drupal specific knowledge. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering if there are any plans for discover Drupal to kind of like join forces with with EDUs, either colleges or high school, um, to kind of offer uh, a certificate program or, or be able to kind of get into the stream there where, um, you know, the, the prospective student would have maybe more time to be able to complete the program before kind of needing to go out and look for that job. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. And that's something that we've talked about doing. Um, I think the the biggest challenge, at least internally, what is the capacity side. So ideally, we'd have a full time person <laughs> running this program, Heather and I were like, we don't want to wait for that uh, to come because um, that could be a while. So let's mm -hmm. try to get this going and rely on volunteers and try to fundraise the heck out of it and see what we can do. So um, I, there definitely ideally would be someone that was able to just spend the time to go out and do that. So um, the cool thing is that like, I haven't had to search for opportunities to talk about this. People come to me because okay. they hear about it and they think it's great. Um, so I think once we're able to put more resources on it, I mean, for me, I'm, since I, my first role is the financial role, role which is obviously a really important role. There are times where I've had to, you know, not put as much focus on this program because I have some other really important thing going on. So um, that's our biggest challenge internally. Uh, and I think we will, you know, it's just organically um, 
I think going to continue to grow and we can also start to more intentionally give resource that program because mm -hmm. people are excited about it, I think. Um, we've gotten really great feedback um, from the community, I think, um, from people that aren't in the community as well. I mean, the response from students when I talk about it is they're like, this just is so cool. I want to be a part of it. Um, hmm. And I think that's really awesome. So. Yeah, it's interesting because it's it's one of those things where you're you're always you know as a company you're always trying to find that that talent and I I may be misquoting here but I feel like at one point maybe um, Martin your former your former employee digital echidna had an actual talk about building like a pipeline and working with mm -hmm. um, colleges and universities to kind of build that pipeline and this is like like it's great to be able to build that pipeline but I, I think one of the key things that's missing there is like Drupal specific training, right? Because like yeah. you come out of college and you have a degree in like computer engineering or, or, you know, like coding, coding things. Right. But it's not necessarily specific to Drupal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's not like a Drupal class you're going to take while you're <laughs> in high right. school or college necessarily. So Unfortunately. I, yeah, I think the possibilities are huge and that's really exciting. Um, and, you know, we we have plans with some of our existing roles to put some more focus on um, on these things and not just the Drupal training, but also, you know, enabling contributions so that people know how to do yeah. that and participate. Um, that's a big fo strategic focus for us as well. So, uh, well, I, I'm actually curious about the financial aspect. Um, in Maybe maybe a little bit more so than normal because you're in a financial role, but <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, thinking about scale because you know, like like you said at the top of the show, this this is helping um, certainly an underserved community, but it's a mutual benefit for the Drupal community. Like the Drupal community needs that talent as well. Mm -hmm. um, if you're thinking about scaling this program to something, you know you know, 80, 800, 8,000 students a year or something like that. Like what, what kind of um, financial contribution do you need per student? Um, Cause you have like the supporters providing laptops and donations mm -hmm. and stuff. Is the financial aspect really just the actual training or are there other? Yeah, the, so um, there's some, so there's some cost administratively on our end to um, run the program. So there's the staff time, there's mm -hmm. the admin costs, which are low. We have really low administrative overhead at the DA, which I'm proud of. Um, but we also want to, you know, make sure that it's it's well resourced. So staff position, and, and you know, the costs. I think it it's hard to say based on that number because when you start getting into volume, the cost per student goes down. So like the training yeah. part would stay the same. But the admin cost maybe is lowered because, you know, it's not a one one to one, one employee to yeah. one um, student. Um, and then the trainers that we have now, you know, they, their costs are um, might be different from someone global. So there's some other factors um, in there as well. But I think that the ideal situation would be. Um, if we were able to like apply for a grant. So the, the Drupal Association is a 501c3, for instance, if we okay. were able to either get um, a big agency or um, a foundation to um, provide like kind of a seed fund so that we could start scaling okay. the program because some of the other stuff we need to do is just in, invest in program design. I mean, I think we did a great job for a pilot program with really limited <laughs> staff time and leaning on some yeah. volunteers, but, um, and volunteers are awesome. And we always want to include volunteers, but people get burned out and there's only some, especially yeah. right now, um, there's only so much, um, that you, we want to, we want to make sure that we, we keep the resiliency of the program in mind. So, um, are there connect. government grants available for there? things like this as well. Yeah, so Gwen, Gwendolyn and I chatted a little bit about the government grant, grant side of it. And I think now that we have one program year under our belt and we can kind of speak to 
um, the level of interest from students that there's now kind of a story we can tell along with either a government grant or a more traditional um, nonprofit foundation relationship. Um, a lot of foundations are going in the direction of place-based funding. So the only challenge with that is that, what I mean by that is they want to fund programs in their backyard. So like um, I have relationships and foundations in Detroit and all over the country, but they, they're funding programs mm -hmm. specific to their cities or their regions. Um, and sense. that's a little bit of a trend. Um, and that can sometimes be true for government grants too, if you're talking about state level or uh, state governments federally. Um, it's place-based just in the sense that it would be a, then a U.S. program. So yeah. um, magic bullet here, if there is a magic bullet, would be like some Google or <laughs> some company with lots of money is like, this is really cool. Let's just give you a bunch of money to like go figure this out. Obviously, there's interest. People want to do it. So that would be maybe. like fantasy world for yeah. me. <laughs> I mean, maybe if Google can use the search override module to like manage their search results a little bit better. <laughs> maybe, I don't know. <laughs> and, our, and, our, and our episode has come full circle. <laughs> Good job. Well done. Angie, yeah, you, I, mentioned, go ahead. you mentioned earlier that a couple of students hadn't actually been able to finish the program because they got jobs even while they were still going through it. Is there a plan to sort of track? Um, you know, recruitment percentage in terms of people who sort of get hired in Drupal roles after finishing the program? Absolutely. Um, we, we're we hoping actually to um, have an opportunity for the students to meet with the companies that were direct sponsors of the program, excuse me, at DrupalCon. So we're, we're providing space. Uh, there'll be a meet and greet for the students and the sponsors. And then oh, okay. we'll also at DrupalCon be opening up if there are other employers there that are interested in meeting with the students. Um, hmm. But again, it's these folks are coming out at an at an entry level, you know, they're not, they don't have five to 10 years of Drupal experience or whatever people consider to be senior Drupal developers. So there's still a gap there, I think, that um, I want to figure out a way where, that we can chat with some of the higher level folks, whether it be um, HR or CEO level people and say, hey, we need you to commit to starting these journeys with students early on and getting them in at an intern level, um, because that's what we, yeah. we're going to need in order for you to address your talent short, shortage. You'll need to invest um, in these folks at the beginning of their career journey. Yeah. Makes sense. Well, Angie, thank you for joining us. It's been a pleasure discussing the Discover Drupal program and hopefully uh, hopefully, our listeners will have some ideas and, and support the program as well because yeah, like, like we've been saying, it's definitely something that addresses a lot of needs from a lot of different angles. Thanks so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Do you have questions or feedback? Reach out to Talking Drupal on Twitter with the handle Talking Drupal or via email at show at talkingdrupal.com. You can connect with our hosts and other listeners on Drupal Slack in the, in the Talking Drupal channel. If you're interested in show news, upcoming Drupal camps, local meetups, Chad's book corner, and Abby's biweekly game review, sign up for our newsletter at talkingdrupal.com slash newsletter. And you can promote your Drupal community event on Talking Drupal. Learn more about that at talkingdrupal.com slash camp promo. Thank you, patrons, for supporting Talking Drupal. Your support is greatly appreciated. You can learn more about becoming a patron at talkingdrupal.com and choosing the Become a Patron button in the sidebar. And Angie, if our listeners wanted to get in touch with you about this or anything else, what would be the best way to do that? Yeah, they can reach out to me directly, um, angie.sabin, S-A-B-I-N, at association.drupal.org. We also have an email specifically for the program that's drupaltalent at association.drupal.org. So either of those would okay. be a great way. And Martin, if listeners want to get in touch with you. On drupal.org, Drupal Slack, or various social platforms, they can find me as Mandclue. And John, how about you? 
find me on all the major social networks, andrewble.org at John Picozzi, and you can find out about EPAM at epam.com. And listeners can find me pretty much everywhere at Nixvan, N-I-C-X-V-A-N. And if you've enjoyed listening, we've enjoyed talking. Have a good one, everyone. See you next week.